SciShow Tangents, the huh? lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. Okay. I'm your host, Hank Green. How can I, how did you guys convince him to do this when I can't get him to do Dear Hank and John? Well, I felt bad that day, and I felt better today. What if you do like the first 20 minutes, and then you let Sam I just, take I over? I just leave, and I'm like, bye. Yeah. I think I might be good. What about if okay. John took over, huh? Okay, John's just going to sit in the room with me, which will be very awkward for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think and he's going to have to listen to your poem, too. So you He know. is. Okay. And joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. I'm worried about how, how to cut whatever just happened, but okay, <laughs> hi. <laughs> <laughs> You'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Since none of us have our siblings actually in the room with us <laughs> right now at all, right. let's talk about our, <laughs> our siblings. What do we got and how do we feel about them? I have an older brother. He's three years older, and he is a bit of a pain in my neck sometimes. Oh, Aww. Oh, my God. <laughs> Are you actively asking me? To justify my when I'm the opposite of a pain in the neck. <laughs> you can just sigh heavily over there. That's all you're allowed to do. How do you feel about your your sister, Sari? She is three years younger than me. Mm. And I think we are also very different, but I don't have a longstanding creative collaboration with her. And I think as many yeah. siblings do we actually got along really really well growing up and then we stopped talking once i was in high school and moved away and only recently we've started trying to do phone calls again so that's it's nice. possible after a decade it to is. like and you can exist. also always start a video blog project with them and that that yeah. will really really yeah. bring you together uh-huh <laughs> yeah maybe then she'd be closer by maybe even in the same room with me if you right had now. a video blog project with your sibling what would it be about Oh, it would probably be, she's really into video games. Like she wants to be a programmer and is, has been like uh-huh. working towards that. And so the only videos nice. we have c- creatively collaborated on are Super Smash Brothers based in which <laughs> I was just like the second person as she demonstrated various techniques. That is big. That is big sibling behavior. You were getting big sibling in that moment by yeah. her. <laughs> I probably deserved it after after being a big sibling for my entire life and a little yeah. bit bossy. Sam, if you had a sibling uh, podcast or video blog, what would it be about? I have tried to get him to stream with me so many times <laughs> in my life. So that's what we would do. We would stream because he's fun. He's a fun little yeah. guy and we play Fortnite together all the time. But that Wilbur is a hell of a guy. He's my best bud. His Aww. name's Wilbur? Yeah, his name's Wilbur also. That's Isn't that name. great? I'm the only little brother in the room. You guys are you guys are big siblings, and I'm a little sibling, but I feel like I'm the one that's in charge all the time. Maybe it's maybe I'm overcompensating for something. Are you ever in charge of your big sibling? Uh, all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> though though recently he has become in charge of me. If you're not aware of what's going on, I'm going through treatment for Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the best kind of lymphoma to get. And it's going well, and I'm feeling uh, well right now. It's been like 10 days since my last treatment, or my first treatment. And so I'm pretty well recovered from the chemo. Uh, and so I wanted to make a podcast, and my friends got together to do that with me. So thank you for that. Every week here at Dantits, we get together to try to one-up a maze and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for Glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding to them as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. But first, we must introduce this week's topic with a traditional science poem. This week, because of the scheduling piece of confusion, will be delivered first by Sari, and then a second (laughs) one by me. The record books are littered with distance over time. The fastest car, the fastest bird, the fastest rock wall climb. And we need Mm. the speed of light to understand the universe. But I fear that move fast break things can sometimes bring out our worst. Sure, we also have a record speed for the slowest of the slow. Sloths go about their day without thinking of that, though. You need not be the mostest when going for a run to stretch your legs and stretch yourself and just enjoy the sun. So speed can stay. Don't go and throw all physics in the trash. It's useful as a quantity, not an excuse to act all rash. The ever ticking clock leads us to measure thought or art, but to take the steps to know and grow, you don't need a breakneck start. 
Mm-hmm. Lovely. Bit I was so wasn't it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> to, okay. To get out of my life. <laughs> I was super confident that we were going to go in different directions on this, and I was correct. Here's our second science poem for the day. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to the story of Howard Payne, a man who didn't want to bomb a car or plane or train. No, he wanted to bomb a bus, which is very good news for us, because the story became a classic of our day. But he was far too diabolical to just let the bus explode. No, he had a grander plan for his cinematic episode. (laughs) Once the bus hit 50, things got risky swiftly because the bomb was armed and it would blow as soon as the bus slowed. He didn't count, however, on two people we'd all need, a dramatic couple thrown together, and now they must succeed. Sandra and Keanu Reeves, I need to see them, please. Delight my senses on the screen in the hit movie Speed. (laughs) I hate you. <laughs> that did the topic up. for the day is speed. <laughs> uh, Sari, what's speed? It's pretty. We've hit one that's easy to define. There was. There's going to be very little to say here, which is wonderful. Yeah, it's great, and you gave me knowledge too. This is a little a little trade off. I know now know the plot summary of the movie Speed. Have which, you ever seen it? No. Did you know it existed before this exact moment? Yes, but only because I googled what is speed into to like do the definition, <laughs> and then Keanu Reeves' face came up, and I was like, "Hmm, that must be a movie that's not the Fast and Furious, but also has to do yep. with fastness." Great film, but speed the the physics concept is the uh, rate at which some an object, anything's position changes. It's distance divided by time is the equation to calculate it. And that's super easy as long as you don't have to define distance or time, which we're not going to do. <laughs> yeah, you just a distance is like you walk a certain amount, time. You know time. Uh, you know time. It marches yeah. on. <laughs> the SI units are meters per second. And so that that's the easiest way you can define distance over time. You know, throw a ball, a certain number of meters. It flies for a certain number of seconds, and then you can calculate its speed. That's a textbook problem Simple. right there. And you don't have to care about direction. Like, speed is one of the simpler physics quantities, where velocity, you need to know what direction something's going. Speed, don't have to worry. Just needs to be moving, and that's it. And speed can be slow, too, can't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. speed can be extremely slow. If, even the slowest things have speed. Yep, even the, wi- the small, small wiggles, because nothing... Is absolute zero. And so that's right. Absolute zero speed. would be zero speed, but the wiggles oh, wow. around us yeah. have a tiny, tiny bit of speed. Do we know where this word comes from? Yes. This is actually surprisingly interesting. Um, so, speed for most of its existence in the English language meant not uh, the, the fastness of something, it meant a lot of other things, though. It meant, it meant things like power or might. It meant things like abundance. So the speed of something is the abundance of something. And most significantly, it meant like success or prosperity um, or help or good fortune, things like that. The phrase Godspeed is like came Mm. from that definition of speed Uh. of prosperity, Uh. like Godspeed to you. So I hope God gives prosperity to you. And then... What the heck? At some point in the 1300s, scientists started getting more science-y, and we were like, I guess we need something for when things go fast, and they just claimed speed for that word, and and starting in around the 1300s, um, that started meeting the rate of motion or progress, and I think that has eclipsed these other meanings of speed, but for, for a very long time, it didn't mean that. It just meant like... Good on you. Good job. I love it when there are those weird things that hang about forever, uh, like Godspeed, where it, mm-hmm. you're like, that doesn't make any sense. And it turns out that it made perfect sense. Like, I like by Jove. No one knows what Jove is. Oh. Uh, but it's Is Jupiter. that also God? It's the, it's God, it? it's the God Jupiter. God. Jove. And so it's by God, but that other God. Uh, so we have all these words that we say, but we don't know what they mean, but they're because they like hung out as part of a phrase that we still use. But I used to think Godspeed and I've used it as like, hope you go fast. 
Yeah, that fool can probably really move yeah. it, you know? Go to your next yeah, yeah. destination, that- Godspeed. But really, it God means speed. like... <laughs> yeah. that's too. use those little wing shoes and go- and godspeed to you but yeah. it really means like good luck well i feel like i know a bunch of things now more than i did before and that means that it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show this week we're going to be playing this or that speed edition because when you think of speed you probably think of races car races running races swimming races anything that can be put into a lane or a starting block of some kind and then you you, you get put to the test but The world is full of things that can't be physically pit against each other in a race for our viewing pleasure. So to fill that void in the market, we have science trivia games. (laughs) More specifically, it's this or that. I'm going to describe two things that exist in the universe, and it's going to be up to you to decide which of those things is faster. That's easy to know how this works. Which of these is faster? So first, thanks to uh, our many creative approaches to transportation, humans can travel very fast. But which of the following is faster? The fastest recorded submarine speed or a car driving at the maximum speed in Montana? Montana specifically? Yeah, specifically Montana's maximum speed limit. 90 miles per hour? No, we're 85? not completely out of our minds. <laughs> <laughs> used to I'm be gonna, none. Used to be it, used to be infinite, but that is that that changed. Just, the yeah. federal government made us change it. Reasonable and prudent is what the sign said. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never got to experience or enjoy that, but my dad did. I think we should put some real money on this area. I think. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> like how, like betting on real races? You know, hundred bucks. <laughs> A hundred? I was going to say one (laughs) dollar. The Sam seems confident. I would not bet with him right now. The Sam have like a bunch of weird submarine knowledge we don't Uh, know about. No. I bet submarines are slow. I do like the idea, though, of giving you guys money every episode. But not real money. Would you give us real money? Just I'll just like bust open my wallet and I'll Venmo you at the end of every episode. (laughs) Me and Sarah would be at each other's throats. We wouldn't be friends anymore. (laughs) Just last episode, Hank, you missed it. I told Sari officially she was my friend. And now you're trying to tear us apart? Yeah, I'm officially friend and family. And family as well. Sam had just watched Fast and the Furious and was feeling extremely (laughs) Uh, sentimental. (laughs) It was a big episode. I'll take it, though. Family! Okay. I think submarines are slow as hell, so I bet cars faster. I think cars faster, too. I bet, yeah. I think It's so gooey down in the ocean, you know? It's It's wet. They just got to bloop around. Cars are so dry. That's yeah. speed. Best speed, baby. You are both correct because uh, those submarines are faster than I would have expected it at a top speed of 51 miles per hour. Designing fast submarines is hard because you got to balance speed with keeping them quiet so you can sneak up on enemies. Oh. In 1959, the Soviets decided to see if they could uh, strike that balance with the project design uh, a high-speed submarine they could sneak up and shoot missiles at American carriers and then speed away. And they used a titanium alloy instead of steel to keep the weight lower and the submarine was powered by two water reactors that helped move it really quickly and the final submarine was around 107 meters long and it held 82 officers and seamen and during a test run in the 60s uh they were able to go 51 miles per hour at 100 meters under the surface which remains the underwater speed record for submarines that we know of because there's a, you know, they just top there secret things always happening. Uh, the Los Angeles there. class attack submarines today have an official top speed of 23 miles mm. per hour. Pathetic. So there's, there's animals that are faster than that. Is being secret definitionally part of a submarine? Or is it just that no one will fund a non-secret submarine? Because I feel like you could try to go faster if you really wanted to, but... Someone's mm-hmm. made the rule yeah. that you've got to be quiet and secret. Right, right. Well, it's not the rule. It's like what you want to do. Yeah. You know, that's your yeah. goal. Otherwise, you just put it above the water and it'll might go as way well faster because you... Or a plane. You might as well have a boat. If you don't want to hide, sure. just be a boat. And it turns out that <laughs> at, at its maximum speed, it was extremely loud and it made it unusable as a uh, attack submarine. <laughs> so hmm. that's why that isn't a thing anymore. Round number two, though... Well, let's see if we can get some differentiation here. An egg of the African clawed toad will end up facing the same dilemma that many other eggs do. Will it get fertilized and divide, or will it remain unfertilized and die? 
Scientists have measured the speed at which the signals driving either fate travel in the frog's egg. So which is faster, the signal for mitosis or the signal for cell death? That's not where I thought the question was going. I thought it was like the egg is going to fall off a cliff or something. No, yeah, it's literally <laughs> the, the, the speed of signals within the cell. Yeah. Huh. Egg's got to be one of the least fast things on Earth. Yeah, but it's side. It could be quite quick, maybe. Death has got to be faster, right? You get the cell death signal, and then mitosis is like, wait, 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 wait. I actually uh. want to fix things. Like, that feels easier, maybe? I don't know. They're both. This is a toss-up. I can't apply any of my biology mm -hmm. knowledge for shame when I get it wrong. But I'm going to say death. And I don't have any biology uh, knowledge, so I'm just going to say the opposite of what Sari said which is life. The answer was mitosis. So uh, mitosis travels at 60 micrometers per minute and apoptosis 30 micrometers per minute. So mitosis is twice as fast. The egg cells uh, are around 1.2 millimeters in diameter. Just for clarity, this is uh, the faster version of this is 0 0.00013 miles per hour. So it's hmm. not super fast, <laughs> but uh, doesn't have to go very far. So, th so this is pretty big. 1.2 millimeters, pretty big for a cell, of course. And because of that size, scientists have wondered how all or nothing decisions like mitosis or apoptosis get signaled and synchronized throughout the whole cell. Theoretically, you could have a signal molecule or an enzyme diffused through the cell. And for a small cell, that's not a problem. But for a big old egg ready to go through mitosis, that enzyme would need to, uh, it would need two hours to diffuse throughout the cell, which is slower than the speed at which mitosis happens. Mm -hmm. And what scientists have found is that in the egg, processes like mitosis and cell death involve various feedback loops that create trigger waves that allow the signal to travel oh. over large distances at a constant speed. And those waves exist in a lot of different contexts, including action potentials or the way that uh, fire spreads through a field. So just like is also a, an example of a trigger wave. And so they were actually able to measure this in one of these frog eggs uh, undergoing mitosis in 2013, which is remarkable that you can figure that out. Yeah. What did they do? Stick a, some kind of a metal thing into it, I bet. A speedometer, obviously. <laughs> yeah. They shot it with one of them radar guns. Beep, beep. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our last question here, what is faster? So to report a speed, it helps to know the frame of reference, especially when we're talking about things in space. So I'll give you a frame of reference for this one because it's going to be space. Which of the following is faster? The speed of our galaxy relative to the cosmic microwave background or the speed of a recently discovered runaway supermassive black hole relative to the home galaxy it was ejected from? I have no context for things in space. Correct. Yeah. And... I feel like, so the the way I'm going to play this one is by metagaming it. It feels mm. like oh, a no. supermassive black hole being ejected from a galaxy seems so fast. And it seems like, oh, just the Milky Way. Wow, we live here. I don't s experience us hurtling through space. I mean, we've had the entire Big Bang and all of galactic history or universe history to to expand away from but you're right they're both very fast i think mm. it's the milky way because i like the idea that we are unknowingly well we already are kind of unknowingly besides mm. seasons and whatnot hurtling through space so why not super super fast yeah i have no freaking idea but it does seem like a trick question to me so i want to say the milky way also you're both wrong it no. is uh, very fast <laughs> The Milky Way relative to the CMB is 1.3 million miles per hour, which is not no is no joke. Whereas that supermassive black hole is going 3.5 million miles per hour relative to its home galaxy. Oh so my God. it takes a lot of energy to get a black hole going uh, at all, but getting it going 3.5 million miles per hour does not right. seem doable, and yet here we are. In April, a team of researchers who had been using the Hubble telescope to study a dwarf galaxy 7.5 billion light years from us reported that they'd found a supermassive black hole roaming interstellar space after getting ejected from its home galaxy. And it's around 20 million times the mass of the sun, this black hole. It appears to be traveling away from its galaxy 3.5 million miles per hour, which is fast enough to go from the Earth to the moon in 14 minutes. 
Scientists were able to calculate the speed of our galaxy relative to the cosmic microwave background because of a weird quirk in the CMB. It's the microwave radiation left over from the Big Bang, and it permeates the whole universe, and it has a very uniform temperature of 2.725 kelvins, except for a slightly cooler temperature around the Aquarius constellation and a slightly warmer temperature around the Leo constellation. (laughs) And scientists realized that those temperature dipoles are the result of our movement relative to the CMB, and we can Uh, use them to calculate how fast our local group of galaxies is moving relative to the CMB. Based on those calculations, about 1.3 million miles per hour. Wild, weird, I don't know, we figure out so much stuff just by looking up. Where's that black hole going to? Just around. Just the next spot, you know. How long can you go five million miles a second or whatever? Forever? Yeah. Oh. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) As far as we can tell, everything's just going to kind of keep going roughly in the same direction. It's going forever. Well, that's weird. (laughs) (laughs) That's the most normal reaction to space. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. Just like a... Where is it all? No, I don't know. Man. Well, Sam, you came out of that with two points. Sari with one. Next, we're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back for the fact off. Welcome back, everybody. It's time for the fact off. Our panelists have brought science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. On January 28th, 1896, Walter Arnold of East Peckham, Kent, was given the first known speeding ticket ever issued for an automobile driver in the world. Oh. How fast was Arnold driving? Arnold, you bad boy. <laughs> Boy, gosh, 1896. They could probably go like 12 miles an hour, maybe. I bet he was going 13 miles an hour. Crazy. No, he's probably Wild. going 22. I'm gonna say 22. I'm trying to think, how fast is a horse? It's not just how fast is a horse, but like how fast should a horse be going? In, yeah, in Kent. Mm, mm-hmm. In Kent, and then he was like, "I got my little automobile." I'm gonna guess. I'm going to guess like 10 miles an hour. I feel like he was very slow. Well, Sari, that is very close. He was going (gasps) eight miles per hour. The speed (laughs) limit was two. Two? The least bad boy speed out there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What the heck? (laughs) So he was supposed to be going two miles per hour, which is, uh, I I do, like, that is below walking speed. (laughs) Yeah. Why would you even have a car at that point? (laughs) I think we'll carry all the stuff. I guess so. That's true. You got to carry all that stuff. Supposedly, uh, in the story, as it goes, the local constable had to bike five miles before eventually catching Arnold. (laughs) It was also the first high-speed chase. (laughs) What? You bike so much faster Uh, than eight miles an hour, don't you? Maybe it was really muddy. I don't know. A really bad bike? Yeah, really bad road. They should have had someone run. The local constable should have just hoofed it. An eight mile an hour car chase for five miles. Yeah, <laughs> that's why. Yeah, you can. You can. P- people can run eight miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, not me though. So that means Sarah gets to go first. In July 2012, experimental and theoretical physicists alike celebrated because evidence of the Higgs boson, casually known as the God particle, from a 1993 pop science book, was announced to the world. And we learned about it by smashing other particles together at really high speeds in the Large Hadron Collider. But before the LHC was in operation, and even before the book that gave the Higgs boson its nickname came out, there was a different super fast particle detected on Earth that captured everyone's attention or at least scientists' attention. On October 15th, 1991, the Oh My God particle flew through our atmosphere. Uh, This particle is considered an ultra-high-energy cosmic ray, which is anything above one exa-electron volt, 
or EEV, which in turn is around a billion times the average energy level of most cosmic rays. And it was detected by the Fly's Eye Cosmic Ray Detector, which was operated by the University of Utah from 1981 to 1993. By analyzing the faint glow from the particle's interaction with air molecules in the atmosphere as captured by the detector, physicists calculated that the Oh My God particle had an energy of 320 exa electron volts. That's faster than anything the LHC can accelerate nowadays and is closer to the speed of light in a vacuum than we had ever seen before and, as far as I can tell, have ever seen since. To put this in perspective, even though the Oh My God particle was subatomic and thought to be like an atomic nucleus or proton, but we couldn't tell exactly, it packed the same kinetic energy of something macroscopic like an over 50 mile per hour baseball throw. Huh? Um, what? Yeah, so like absolutely wild amount of speed and energy in this very very I thought, well, uh, but I hope for, what what if one hit me? I think it'd be an ouchie. I think it'd be a big ouchie. <laughs> <laughs> and it flew well, through uh, the atmosphere? Yeah, right above Utah. It was a proton and it hit as hard as a baseball. Yeah. I'm Same. having a hard time with this. It is could this uh, happen to me at any moment? It's very, very rare. So from my understanding, this is so rare and had never occurred before that these scientists did the calculations again and again for like a year to make sure that what they detected was real because it was outside of the realm of cosmic rays we ever expected to detect. Um, specifically, these the Oh My God particles energy levels smashed through a theoretical cosmic ray speed limit called the GZK cutoff, named after the three physicists who calculated the speed limit, which said that any particle in space with more than 60 exa electron volts would slow down because of interactions with space radiation. And this, again, was 320. And since then, though, we've built fancier particle detectors and noticed hundreds of ultra-high energy cosmic rays above the GZK cutoff, though only a handful of events, like 10 to 15, that even approach the fluke speed and energy of the oh my god particle if it hit you would you explode or would you just go <gasps> like if it hit you right in the gut <gasps> i don't know like it has a lot of kinetic energy but i don't know like what happens when it interacts with another thing because we usually see it fly through the atmosphere i don't know if it like disperses that energy somehow that kinetic energy mm. i i think that there must be like it must be that be because it's so small it would have few interactions with the molecules mm -hmm. or like with the actual atoms. Like it'd have to actually hit a nucleus. It probably would just fly through you. And if it hit an atom, it would probably ionize it really significantly. Like it'd probably destroy the molecule, definitely destroy the molecule. But I don't know that it would like hit with a physical force because it's a subatomic particle because it wouldn't be able to impart its energy in all of its energy into you. It's not a baseball. Yeah. It's not a baseball. Yeah. Flying from space. You are going through, I think, the same things that these scientists went through, which is like, what what the heck is this? Um, but the fact that they exist also means that they had to come from somewhere, which is an even bigger yes. mystery. Because uh, yes. high-speed cosmic rays or cosmic rays in general usually come from events like supernovae, which are explosive and act like natural particle accelerators. And to achieve these speeds in Earth's atmosphere, the origin of these particles must be relatively close by. And mm. as of a 2017 study, we know they're not from within the Milky Way galaxy, but that's about all we've narrowed down. So where they come mm. from theoretically should be something flashy and high energy and obvious and like, it is obviously mm. this very energetic thing nearby us. But we know the direction it came from, right? But stuff's moved. So if you don't know when oh, it happened. Shoot, I forgot stuff moved. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, speed. That's Supermassive bad. black holes are flying even faster That's than right. these particles through space. So I think this one's got to be an alien. An alien just floating <laughs> around and he's like, pew, pew. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a, but yeah, we don't know where to look now. because space is too freaking big. And so the oh my God particle remains a mystery. And I can't believe That's I hadn't heard wild. of it before researching this episode because it Have is. Have we found other ones in anywhere else? Uh, yeah, they just don't have a name like this because this is the okay. first and highest energy. Um, yeah. But the yeah. the next highest energy is in like the 200 something exa electron volts range. Like people are now specifically looking for these ultra high energy particles because they are so weird. 
like we've detected a handful of them. I forget what the the statistic was. I did not write it down. It was like something per square kilometer per century is is like the rate <laughs> of it. So like yeah. very very infrequently, like things will happen. Frequent in enough an area. though. Yeah. That like maybe yeah. we will someday be able to use them to find out something interesting about something. Yeah. John is back in my room. Hello. Hi. How's it going? Good. Has tangents. Good. I just found out about a high energy particle oh, no. traveling so fast that if it were to be able to impart its energy to you, it would be like getting hit by a baseball going 50 miles per hour. And it's uh, the size of a uh, atomic nucleus. I think I could take that. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> yeah. bet you could. Yeah, I could. Yeah. I bet he could, as long too. As long as on the arm. Yeah. I'm just going to stay here for the next 10 no, minutes. Don't do that. Oh, I'm so scared. I'm that's going to make it. That's definitely going to make it take more time. Thanks, Tangents fans. I'm wait. You're not cutting me out, are you? I don't think I can. I don't think it's possible to cut you out at this point. Yeah, I'm cutting <laughs> some of you out. <laughs> yeah, you're not. The whole, you're not gonna. The whole. The whole. I thought this was my Tangents debut. I was very excited. It is. It is. We haven't even it? seen your face. I'm very excited about the concept. In yeah. Way. Close the door all the way, though. <laughs> you left the door open. He just. He just left the door open. Okay. Well, I guess that's how it's, how it's going to be. All right. Well, Sari, <laughs> that is a mind-blowing fact. Sam, what do you uh, have for us? I don't want to do mine anymore. Needlefish are a family of very long, pointy-faced fish ranging in size from one inch to three feet that live pretty much all over the world in shallow and surface waters. Their relative longness is, in fact, so pronounced that they're commonly called long toms. <laughs> Needlefish travel around shallow waters in schools, <laughs> hunting uh, for schools of smaller fish, which they can catch with 1.5-foot lunges, which is all very normal fish behavior. But in 2015, biologists off the coast of Australia's Heron Island observed needlefish hunting prey and doing something very abnormal as far as fish behavior goes. About half of the attacks on the prey fish were done by leaping out of the water, traveling almost six feet, and then plunging what? back in to catch the prey from above. Whoa! Like they could see it six feet away and they jump out of the water and land six feet away? I don't think anybody's really figured out how they're doing the math on that one, but they are catching them. So yeah, needlefish exactly. jumping isn't weird at all because they're part of the same order of fish that includes flying fish, which are famous for their mm -hmm. ability to jump out of the water and glide almost 200 feet through the air. And in fact, it seems like all the fish from this order like jumping a lot. They do it to escape predators or maybe to travel or maybe even just for fun. I don't know. But none of the rest of them do it for hunting. In fact, these jump hunting needlefish are the first fish of any kind ever observed jumping out of the water to attack prey that is also under the water. So some jump out and like uh -huh. get birds, but no other mm -hmm. fish jump to get other fish. So the reason they do this isn't really as exciting as the fact that they do it. I need to interject here. Okay. And I need to tell you that these fish are not small. I thought that they were, <laughs> would be small. Some are. they're called needlefish. Are... Yeah. There are some that are very big. There are like some that are over like over a meter long. long. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they have really funny pointy mouths that look very yeah. happy bad bad would be bad to get hit by <laughs> just wait till the end of my fact no okay spoilers, all right okay oh no oh no uh so the reason they do this isn't exciting as the fact that they do it in the first place but it's thought that the leap gives them the element of surprise and also most sure. of their prey jump out of the water to avoid getting lunged at so coming in from above you can't jump out of the water away from that but maybe the deadly nature of the needlefish jump isn't so surprising if you already knew something about them these guys aren't just doing your classic lazy fishy flop out of the water to catch a bug or whatever these fools are going really fast when they break the surface of the water like 40 miles per hour <gasps> and because some of these guys can get up to three feet long these jumps aren't just dangerous to fish over the years there have been several instances of severe human injury and even death caused by schools of needlefish swimming past swimmers and people in small boats including people being stabbed in the heart through the eye and into the brain in the spine and in the neck and there's lots of gross pictures so don't google it unless you want to see gross pictures all the places basically you don't want to be stabbed by a fish and then some <laughs> i don't have any i don't have any places i want to be stabbed by a fish well you know what it's gonna happen sometimes and light seems to get these guys jumping even more so night swimming or fishing with some kind of light can put you at even more risk so i guess next time you're swimming or fishing like anywhere in the whole ocean keep an eye out for these speedy jumping fellows with a unique hunting style but maybe don't keep too close an eye out or maybe one might jump right in your eye and i've just found out that 
sometimes they do this in whole schools because I'm watching a video of it happening yeah. where a bunch will jump all at once and you'll be in a kayak like this man in this video yeah. I'm watching and just getting very lucky and is what's like, happening whoosh, to him. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Yep. Yeah. Right past you. Yeah. Jeez. 40 miles per hour, three feet long. It's like it's like getting hit by a baseball traveling at 50 miles an hour made of <laughs> knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Knives and fish. Meat. Yeah. Nature's lawn darts or jarts. <laughs> <laughs> what do they eat? Other just other fish. Not people. They're not like, oh, I got one. <laughs> no, I think I think when they get uh into a person, maybe their lives into there is my guess. I don't think a lot of people are pulling it out and throwing it back in and being like, okay, see you later, put. <laughs> You'll get it next oh, time, man. little guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Sam, that is a very good fact. I like both of those very much. And like the, oh God, they would both make great TikToks. But I have to, just like Sari said, I kind of can't believe I didn't already know what the fastest ever thing was. Yeah. And now I do. If you if you only count things that have mass and that seems very important for a science guy to know. And and the fact that we have no idea where they come from, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's going to Sarah's going to pull away with that one. That's but but she did. She did come into it losing. Yeah. So it's a tie. Y'all tied. Oh, Oh, thank you. Because Sam's fact was so good. It was good fact. Wow. What a nice ending for us. <laughs> what a nice ending for us. Except it's not the ending. It's time to ask the science couch where we got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. All right. At Scrandall Randall asks, <laughs> what's the fastest a human can go before the body can't handle it? Scrandall Randall looks no good. <laughs> Scrandall Randall is a very fast kind of name. He's building yeah, a rocket great. in his garage, and he's getting a little concerned about how good a rocket he's um, building. I mean, my body can't can't. St- the thing is, bodies can go any speed and be fine because <laughs> oh. speed is is relative, and we are all going mm-hmm. very fast right now. Mm-hmm. It, what the, the the hard part is accelerating to the speed, and that is even goes for me trying to run and like pulling my quad. I could mm-hmm. I could be going just fine <laughs> as long as I'm already going, but the part that I'm going to hurt myself doing is the speeding up. Not the being fast, but the big the big concern is acceleration, which there is a there is an acceleration that no human can handle above ten g's is is definitely starts to be where you can't do it. But if you just spawned into existence going incredibly fast, you'd just we are we that's what spawned. happened to you. You spawned into oh, existence yeah. going incredibly fast. Okay, we learned 1. 3 how million fast miles the, per hour. Yeah, <laughs> the Milky Way okay. is going. <laughs> I guess I am on that, huh? <laughs> there you are. But yeah, yes, it is acceleration is the problem and we we talk about acceleration in terms of g, like that's the easy uh 1 1 g is the acceleration of earth's gravity which is 9.8 meters per second squared. So like drop an apple on earth falls at 1 g, we're all experiencing right. 1 g in general. Yeah, the weird part is that currently you are accelerating downward all of the time. Which does not seem correct, but is correct, and that is you f- you are currently feeling that acceleration. The danger when you change the amount of acceleration that we experience, particularly increasing the amount of acceleration, uh, one is that we are squishy. We have a lot of water and we have a lot of soft organs, and dealing with aggressive acceleration in along axes we're not used to. Uh, can result in like shifting of organs or things bursting in weird ways. And when it comes to vertical G forces, then the the main concern is how our blood is flowing through our body. Specifically, our hearts are have evolved to pump blood to our brains under the acceleration that we're currently experiencing. And so if that gets any more or less, but particularly more, then the blood will start pooling in places of your body Mm -hmm. that are not your brain. And then uh, Mm -hmm. your body can work harder to some extent to try and keep up. And, but after a little bit, your, your brain just doesn't have enough oxygen to survive. You will black out and die. Um, and so the speeds at, and specifically the accelerations that you've got to worry about 
3G is pretty fine. That's like a rocket launch. That's the Gravitron at the fair. You can experience mm-hmm. about the same as a rocket launch and, oh. and what astronauts experience. It's not That's pleasant. In a way. You get a little dizzy. Yeah, I don't like that. But you can you can survive that pretty pretty okay. But once you start getting up to like nine or ten, that's where you can't last very long. Like maybe a couple seconds to a, a a fraction of a minute, but you can't stay under that very very long without your blood pooling a dangerous amount. Like anybody, like not, like even a very highly trained person could not in with like help. Yep, couldn't survive that yes for and there more than seconds. are some like for setting land speed records or air speed records um sometimes mm-hmm. there are g suits that help mitigate the effect of acceleration on people's bodies but i think the fastest recorded acceleration that i could find um someone experiencing is on december 10th 1954 uh, a colonel of the united states air force named john stapp came to a stop and started just as fast on a rocket sled and experienced 46.2 G <gasps> for a couple seconds. Oh. And he was bruised and badly shaken. And Whoa. Uh, was okay, he, though? Yeah, he said he felt a sensation in the eyes, somewhat like the extraction of a molar without anesthetic, ah. uh, which is absolutely awful. There are pictures Did that of that happen? Yeah, had that also happened to him? Well, I don't know, this, I guess. The 50s were bad. <laughs> I love modern medicine. I doubt I could survive, like, six. That's, like, I think, uh, I think the highest G-force on a roller coaster is around six. So, yeah, avoid could, that roller I'm sure coaster. I could do it for a little while. Yeah. But I think that if you did it to me for a couple minutes, I think I'd be done. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents. We will tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week, or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Erica Muir, at Daniel Brotman on Twitter, and everybody else who asked us questions for this episode. If you like the show and you want to help us out, you could do that in a bunch of different ways. First, you can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents. Become a patron. Get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. And i got to send out a special thanks to our patron, Les Aker. Also, don't forget, once we hit 700 patrons, we're going to do a Minions movie commentary. So go subscribe! Be a part of the... We're almost there. Uh, and so you could be the reason we get there. So if you haven't already become a patron at patreon.com slash scishow tangents, uh, do that because we have to see the piss minions. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's super helpful and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for scishow tangents, just tell, tell people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Faith Evelyn Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Tabuki Chakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Nicole Sweeney and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Skippers look like a cross between a butterfly and a moth. They're active during the daytime, but have a fat, fuzzy body. Skipper caterpillars are small and green and make little shelters by rolling themselves up in leaves. That's really cute. And in order to keep their Mm -hmm. leaf rolls clean and avoid attracting predators, they poke their butts out of one end and fling their poop (laughs) far away. Specifically, they have an anal plate that covers their butthole that's held shut by an anal comb structure. When their hemolymph pressure builds up enough, the anal comb latch bursts open to shoot a pellet of frass, a.k.a. poop, away at a speed of around 1.3 meters per second or more, which is pretty dang fast given (laughs) their tiny bodies. Oh, they just just did all little poop shooters. Pew, pew. I love that for them. Get away. That's not going to be good for anybody. Is that like fast enough to kill a bug if it hits a bug? It's it's like it's like a baseball going fifty miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>